The hour is now here when the true worshipers will worship him in spirit and in truth. For God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So God is not like man. So you cannot please him with all your fancy Sunday clothes. You cannot please him with a really good band. You cannot please him with the best tithe check. None of those. He's not a man that he needs those things. God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and with truth. So these are the things that we've explored the past few weeks. So we talked about revelation is essential for us to worship. If you do not see God, you cannot worship God. If I tell you to describe the morning sunrise and never show it to you, how can you describe it? If I tell you, tell me that perfect day on the beach. Some of you have already been to the beach, right? I can, I can tell from your faces. I cannot describe what it was like because I wasn't there. But you have and you've seen it. It's the same with God. When worship, the language of worship, the vocabulary of worship comes from a response to a revelation, to something you've seen. If you've not seen, you cannot respond. So God must reveal himself. And God says, I'm not going to hold back. I'm going to pour out and reveal myself to all people. Now, from there comes a relationship. He wants you to be in relationship with him. That was the second week. From revelation, we move to relationship, which is the second R. And in relationship, he wants you to know him personally, but he wants you to also know him in his holiness and glory, which is not something trivial because he's not like man. He's not just your buddy. He's not just a good father like earthly dads, which was the point I was making to my daughter. While there is symbolism and meaning in the things that we see on earth, he is totally in a different weight class. That's how I described it before. If there was a weight class, he's in a weight class all by himself. And then there are dads. Then there are fathers. But he is father. There is good and good people. And then there is a good God. There, you cannot compare them in the same breath. You cannot use these feeble human understandings to say, oh, God's like that. Because he isn't. He's that and more. But our language fails us, so we say, you are like the mountains. You are like the expanse of the ocean. Your love is so, like we sang it today, right? It's unexplainable. It's, it's, it's something that's so undeniable. Because you're, you're fumbling for words. To describe the love of God. And so when we come back to this whole idea of relationship, he wants to draw you close to himself and he says, I will never push you away just because I am so different. And that is something that is always true in the church. Is God is always portrayed either as this angry, judgmental God or this God who is like, yeah, what's up, buddy? We're cool. Just come, just chill. He is not either of those. He is at the same time the most holy, the most set apart person. And he says, I want you to know that part of me. But guess what? I reveal myself to you as father who loves you. A father comes alongside and he says, come sit with me. It's a precious thing that you have been called into. It is not a trivial thing. So when we say God is our father... It is not something casual. So when Jesus taught the disciples to pray, what did he say? It was the disciples' prayer. What, did, what, is, what, is, what does he say in that prayer? Our? Stop. What? Wait, Jesus, wait. We cannot do that. He is Yahweh, the most holy, the everlasting one. So whenever we address God, we must address him as the holy one of Israel. And he says, no. He's your father and he's my father. You, we're now talking in the same breath as Jesus? That we're almost as equal as Jesus? That was a crazy idea to anyone. All of his disciples included. That Jesus would include them in the benefits that he had. He says, so I want you to pray this way. Pray like this. 
He was not giving them a verbatim thing to rehash. Unfortunately, that's what's happened in the church today. If I say, say the Lord's Prayer, everybody knows how to rattle it off. Even non-Christians do. He, was, he said, pray in this way. Not pray these words. Pray like this. Address your father. And where is he? Is he on earth? Is he like man? Who is in heaven? He's not a father over here. Know where he is enthroned. Know where he comes from. Know that you are not of this place. So you understand that your equation is not of this place either. He is my father who is in heaven. Holy and hallowed be your name. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So you start to see this context that Jesus is putting out for his disciples to pray in a way which addresses their father, acknowledges his total otherness, his total separateness, and he says, now pray that this kingdom of God would be done on earth. And then he immediately returns back to that relational aspect. Lord, give me today my daily bread. Everything I need comes from you. I acknowledge you as the source of my provision. And where I go wrong, where I stumble, Lord, you are a gracious God. So I ask that you would forgive my trespasses and forgive the ones. I use this moment to come talk to you about the people who have wronged me. Because you're my father. So I refuse to let offense fester. So I come and I release the trespasses that have been against me. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. You start to see, Jesus was not giving them something rote to talk or pray when they come to pray. He was saying, this is, if you start to practice these things, you will start to find a holy reverence for God, but a drawing close to who your Father is. You will never ever say, God's only so holy. I need to apologize for this. I need to say sorry for this. The problem is we always get stuck there. What did I screw up this week that I need to go talk to God about? It's almost like going into the principal's office. When God calls his people, he's calling them to relationship that's governed by reverence. And we talked about this in the third week. The third hour was reverence, which is the fear of God is something that is so close to our heart. And this is not a fear that drives us away, like we talked about in the song today. His perfect love casts out fear. A fear that says, stay away. But the fear of God is an awareness of anything that displeases you, anything that separates me from you, alerts me like a, an, a, a huge alarm bell. I, I detest the things that pull me away from you. Wherever the fear of the Lord is mentioned in Scripture, it's an interesting thing if you study it. Most of the verses either explicitly say this, or further in its context, if you read, where the fear of the Lord is described, it is a departing from evil that is paralleled with. The parallel is, when I fear the Lord, I flee from evil. I depart from evil. The New Testament context is James 4, 7. Submit yourself to God. Guess what that submitting is? Bring yourself to an awareness of the fear of God. Resist the devil and he will flee. That is the New Testament working out of something which is an Old Testament truth. Of saying the fear of the Lord keeps me coming to Him so that I can say no to ungodliness. So when we got to responses, I want you to understand that responses is God giving you language and an ability to respond to His heart. Because you're someone who trembles at his presence and trembles at his word. There is an awareness within you that this is not trivial. On any level. Even as my father, there are times I have to take my children aside. And I say, it is for you, sometimes you get so used to me being your dad that you always feel like the casual access that you have to me almost becomes all too familiar. 
And I love that you have access to me. But I want you to know when I open my mouth, it is not casual. So when I spend time with you, it is not casual. When you spend time with your mother, it is not casual. There are, we know from our experiences, not all of us have the time to be with our parents. Some of us have had all kinds of things happen. Time is precious with our Heavenly Father. I take every moment seriously. I take every moment as something that I want to hear. I want to spend time with you, Lord. The casual nature that we treat some of the most important relationships in our lives. Tell us something. The people we love the least intentionally are often the people who are closest to us. Why is it? It's because of a casual access. I, I don't have to work for this access. And because I don't have to work for this access, I don't think about access. I don't think about time. I just think it's there. So when we talk about God as our Heavenly Father, I hope it's ringing some bells inside of you because these are things that we do every day. So for us to come back to God, say, Lord, because I can talk to you on my bed, when I'm just sore and I'm just, I wake up in the morning, I can just say, thank you, Lord. Pray it'll be a good day. Amen. And go for it. That's fine. You have that access. You have the ability on your bed or when you're in the bathroom doing your thing, you, you can talk to God. No one's denying that. But is there a sense of, I'm not, I've not made time for you to hear your thoughts, to hear what you would have to say about my day. To present myself to you. And that's where it's a personal practice that needs to Im improve. Now in scripture, there were several responses about worship. And I talked about this whole idea of thanksgiving, praise, and worship being the three like cornerstones, if you were, if I, if I could put it, distill it into a simple way of understanding, worship is one thing. There's never buckets. But for the sake of understanding, thanksgiving is something that you always bring to God in the context of what He has done for you. It's personal. So when I say thanks, I'm saying thanks for something that I have received. Right? So thanksgiving cannot be ambiguous it cannot be well I guess we say thanks like you know how sometimes nowadays we say thanks to the unit we're like what are you saying thanks for you know like they're random things we give thanks which is why I have it gets my goat every Thanksgiving when people say I'm thankful for I'm like what are you thankful to whom for for, for what whenever someone says I'm thankful I was like it makes a great poster it's a great poster, thankful, but your thankful direction to somebody for something. Articulate, please. Now I understand. Am I being pedantic about something that is a general American holiday? Sure. But you are not like everybody else. You are the people of God. So when, when I challenge you on these things, I'm not just being Judah, oh, that's Judah doing his thing again. Well, you can say that if you want to, but it's Judah challenging you that you have a God to be thankful to for something. So when you say, oh, I'm just thankful, this is a worship response. Go ahead. You're halfway there. Keep going. That is my goal. So my goal is to provoke you in every way possible to say, don't let anything pass by just saying, I'm grateful, I'm thankful. Finish the sentence. Because thanksgiving puts you in a context to praise. Praise is about who God is and what He does. This is just, He shows up, He's, he's this. It's like when, in baseball, when someone has a certain bag, batting, you're like, this is what this guy does. 
in a game, he's going to score. He's going to hit for the fence. He's going to connect at least once this game. You know it in your gut. Why? Because the stats prove it. So the stats are Thanksgiving. And when he comes into the new game, it's not happened yet. But I'm banking on it because this is what he does. Praise is an acknowledgement of who he is. This is what you do. His greatness, his worth, all of these things. So suddenly praise starts to become something that's articulated with words of who he is, even if I have not experienced it personally. You are provider. I might not have faced that yet. I might not have had need where I've seen God provide yet. But guess what? I will. When I praise, it sets me in the context to relate to truth. This is the spirit and truth aspect. So the truth of who God is fuels my worship. Even if my spirit doesn't fully understand some of these things, the Holy Spirit illumines it. And he says, here, I'll give you language to respond to God with. And worship draws you to that part of intimacy with God, which cannot be achieved without knowing Him. Worship is always connected to holiness. So when you talk about adoration, when you talk about the longings of, like that last song we sang, I want to know you, I want your spirit to overwhelm me. Lord, I want you to overtake the places of my heart that are deep within. Now that, fancy song, nice words. But for me to get to that place, I should have a testimony, a stat sheet of who God is. I need to know that this is who he is, naturally speaking, but it's also this is how he operates. And when God reveals that and he shines his light on that revelation, my heart is drawn to a place. Lord, I want to know more of that. And it's a genuine seeking. It's a genuine searching. I'm going to just throw out some words because it's there in Scripture. You have words in, in the Bible which are not just the words praise, thanks, or worship. Right? It would be easy if I would say, let's do a study on worship. And you'd say, well, let's find all the places where it talks about praise. Now that's where a keyword study would help, right? Or something like, oh, let's study all the places where it talks about worship. Unfortunately, in our English Bibles, there are lots of words. Praise, exalt, exalt, extol, magnify, bless, hallelujah, boast, declare, wonder, proclaim, adore, bow, honor, love, kiss, long, desire, search, offering, vow, wait, speak, thanks, consider, depend, pray, trust. All of those words, and that's just, I was just picking ones that I know. There are so many more that all are worship words. But the English word we put down there is search. Or the English word we put down there is desire. So would you understand that desire is a worship word? Would you understand that wonder is a worship word? That wait. Wait? How is wait a worship word? It is. See, it's these kind of things that get lost in English translation because we don't see it. So there are some words I want to just quickly go through so that you understand why worship responses are important. When you start to there are two, two main words. So in Hebrew, the word is shaka. And in uh, Greek, it's the word proskuneo. And both these words have, are translated all across Scripture to mean worship. But it has at its root a bowing or a surrender of self. So in your notes, if you're writing, at the heart of worship is a surrender of self. It's a, bow, it's a lowering of self. I, if I'm up here, I lower myself deliberately, not by way of worship, but deliberately I make a decision to lower myself. Worship is not about me. Period. Say that again. Worship is not 
about me. Put the period there. So, as much as I want you to be blessed by what we do here on Sundays, worship, say it with me, is not about me. So when we come to God, the fact that He draws us in, all the way from thanks to praise, into this intimate place where we get to know Him, guess what? He loves to minister to the things on your heart. Because he's a good father. But worship is not about me. Period. When I get that settled in my heart, the, the way I approach worship is already from a lowered place. I set myself in a lower position, not because he made me. God pushes me down and says, Bow, worship me. That's the thing we get from medieval films. Like, you know, those going to look here. Bow now. I'm the king. I demand. Which is why whenever people describe worship in the context of God's worth, I understand what they mean. And it makes for a really good tagline. Worship is God's worthship. Guess what? His worth stays consistent at 100% whether you recognize it or not. The issue is, as far as you are concerned, is he worthy? As far as you are concerned, are you willing to bow the knee? Anyone who's had a kid knows this truth. I want you to sit down. Sit down. I'm sitting down, but in my heart, I'm standing all the way up. If there was Everest next to me, I'd climb it and I'd stand on top of it. There is a heart that says, I refuse you. Which is why worship is about an internal surrender of position. Because we are driven to drive ourselves into the limelight and say, I matter. And you do but in the context of who he is. So when you do not allow for God to drive that identity, what ends up happening? We push for identity. We lose it in the eyes of other people around us. Then we live in the fear of what other people think of us and their value and what they place on us. This is what the world has got all messed up. So when we talk about self-worth and you laying it down in the presence of God, it's not saying, God's like everybody else. He thinks I'm dirt. He thinks I'm useless. He doesn't. The problem is you've been so busy in the fear of man trying to define yourselves for everybody else. God's sitting there saying, I have made you in my image. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you are mine and, and you come and sit before me, There is something that stands up inside of you. No man, no race, no uh, gender, no whatever people throw at you and say, this is what is going to hold you here. I stand as someone who's chosen by the King of Kings. I belong to him. My identity comes from him. Who I am in my personality, all the failings I have, are covered over by the robe of righteousness that Jesus gives me. So there's a position I stand in that is unassailable. Now I worship. Because my position is no longer in question here. Because worship always comes from a position of relationship. Remember that was a second R. So when relationship is settled, my response is natural. It's not forced. It's not something, I guess I have to worship God because He's worthy. No, no, no. We'll get into that sitting, trying to stand up kind of thing. I guess I got to do it. So when we look in Scripture, there are several words, but because I want to get to this idea of testimony and corporate worship. Because personal worship will always be the breeding ground for responses to God. But what you do here is not personal worship. There's an aspect of you bringing your heart, yes. 
But what we are about in the corporate sense, what we do when we are gathered here is entirely different from what we do in private. And I want to draw that distinction clearly. So worship is deliberately God-centered. God is the consumer of worship, and we are the consumed. If there's another thing for you to write, put it on your wall, put it in your heart. God is the consumer of worship, and I get consumed. I am not here to appreciate music. I am not here to appreciate even the time of day and the coffee and the devo that goes with it. I'm here to be consumed. At the end of my day, when all is said and done and I am about to lay my head on my pillow, Lord, may my life be an offering to you. Was I pleasing to you? There are days, I'm telling you this as someone who grew up leading people in worship since I was about 13. Gr growing in ministry and there would be things where people would be like, Oh, Judah, that was so good. Oh, that was amazing. And many days there were, it was wonderful. And there would be times where I was like, it was the worst. Because I was, what, 14, 15. My voice was cracking. I was a teenager. I couldn't sing straight. I, I said, uh, and you know, I'd be leading worship, and my voice would sound like that. And it would, I would bomb bad. I would start the song in the wrong key. I would, like, mess up chords. My strings would break. And I'd be like, oh, that was just so crap. That was just, just bombed everything. And I'd go down, and someone would say, the Lord met me so powerfully today. Okay, good for you. Because it sucked for me, you know? And I had to learn very quickly as a teenager, worship is not about me, period. And the more I grew into that and started to leave everything on the field, as it were, if I, if, I, if I am to lose my voice, I will lose it. If I am to look like a fool in front of people, I will do it. If I please his heart, that matters more than anything else. Which is why I say it is not about music. Because the moment you leave this door, you are entering a time of worship. I wish, I mean, I, I might do it one day. You, you never know with me sometimes. To put it on the back door... Of our church building. How you know when you have an auditorium. You say you are now entering. A, you know silence silence your phones. You are now entering. You are not entering a time of worship. This is where we get to talk shop. Encourage one another. Build one another up. Guess when the real time of worship is. When you leave. We should have the post. You are now entering a time of worship. On the back door as you are going out. You are now entering a time of worship. This is when the worship service begins. This is your chill out time. I mean, I don't see you guys doing anything right now. Right? So, when you think about it in the real sense of the word, my worship service starts when I start that lawnmower, when I go get the kids in the morning, when I start breakfast. That, this is when worship starts, and it might not have a song. But it has words like, I search for you. I long for you, Lord. I want to know you. These are worship responses that come naturally and they're not contrived. They come out of a heart that's training to be God-centered. Where I get consumed. So personal worship is meant to be an overflow into Meaningful public worship. So what you do here is meant to be an overflow of personal worship. This place cannot drive your personal worship. Your personal worship will drive your public. Because why? Why is that so? Now could it be the other way around? For some people, you could say Judah, you know. 
when we get together, it encourages us to worship God. So that's where it, I really find my, I get fired up when we get together like this. And I find it hard when I'm alone. But guess what? Your heart is shaped on all seven days, barring that one and a half hours you're here. That's when your heart is shaped. So if I were to say this one and a half hours is what's going to shape all seven of these days. When people, when I, I sometimes see it on social media, we can't wait for you to get here on Sunday. This is going to be the most awesome. You're going to uh, get ready for your week. No, no. Your week is already there. Long before this church showed up. Your life was happening long before this church showed up. So when you respond to God in private, now it might be clunky. You might feel like, ah, this doesn't make sense. I feel like I'm not getting anywhere. I don't have those juices. I don't have any worship leader leading me. That's okay. Start with talking responses. Talk with prayer responses. Start with sharing your heart before God. Open His Word. Say, Lord, show me things in your Word. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you. Pray in the Spirit. Praying in other tongues. These are all things that God has given you. Depending on your ability to use these gifts, employ them. Practice these things. Because your heart is developed in secret, not in public. Public worship is meant to encourage you and grow deeper in the revelation that you have in your personal worship. So if there is something God has revealed to you, when you get here, I might have something to share with you. The sister sitting over there might have something to share with you. The brother sitting over here might have something. Just something that... God by His Spirit enlightens by Spirit and truth. It mingles together and you're like, I see something new which I didn't see before. Guess what? It, now go practice that in personal worship. So our public addressing of things in God always is an overflow. So when we come to this gathering where God is looking for worshipers, He's looking for us who gather deliberately. Like every time I hear about the gathering of the church, I hear people use Hebrews 10.25, right? What does Hebrews 10.25 say? Do not, do not forsake the meeting. I mean, I've never seen a, a worse proof text for why we should meet. But it's used all the time because it's a negative, isn't it? It's saying, don't do the, don't do that. We're trying to say do something because it says don't do something. So we're saying you should meet because there are people who don't. That's not a reason. Why are we meeting? That, give me the why. You've not given me the why. You're just telling me that there are people who don't. And it's not really good if you don't. That should be a reason. You're a bad boy if you don't. Hey. That doesn't work. So you need to understand the why pre-existed the church. The formation of what we call the church of Jesus Christ was not what started the gathering. The gathering of God's people, it's all right, they're enjoying, I think, one of their activity stations. I assure you, your kids are safe. <laughs> For anyone on the recording, we are having like some kid screams going on. Um, but for us to understand that the why of gathering is not a church thing. The why of gathering is something because God wanted to reveal himself to his people together. And this goes back, if you look at Deuteronomy... I don't have time to go into this because I've all pretty much out of time. But when you see through the Old Testament, there are reasons why Jesus is each of the offerings that they were meant to bring before God in His tabernacle. Why He was the peace offering, why He was the meal offering, the burnt offerings. Jesus fulfilled different things. And then there were seven feasts that the nation of Israel had to observe. And it started early in the year 
and it went all the way through close to October. It started with the Passover. We celebrated that on Good Friday, right? Jesus died. There is redemption. After Passover comes the unleavened bread, which is Jesus was pure. He was without sin. He was clean. He was righteous entirely for you and for me. So there was something that Jesus fulfilled. From there we go to the Feast of First Fruits, which is celebrated on the third day of the month, which is when Jesus rose from the grave. So you are resurrected too. And Jesus is the first fruits among the new believers. So we are the first fruits along with Jesus being the one who goes ahead of us. So Jesus is the first fruits. So the, fe the feast of first fruits, Jesus was the center of it. And then after that, 49 days after the end of that, which is 50 days later, we have Pentecost, which is the ingathering of the harvest, where you start to have the giving of the Holy Spirit. We have been given His Spirit to approach Him. And then we have, which is called the Feast of Weeks, then we have the Day of Atonement, and then we have the Festival of Booths, where Jesus said, I will come and dwell with you and you will be my people. Now I went through that quickly just to show you. These are all just feasts that the nation of Israel would host. But get what is significant about this is when God was giving the law to Moses, he says, I want this to be for the whole nation. I want them to gather. Now some of these things could happen personally, could happen in individual homes. But the most significant one was the Feast of Booths, which was the end of the year, which is also called the Feast of Tabernacles, where, where they would come together deliberately. Everyone had to come. You're not allowed to not come. Oh my God, oh my God, my, something happened to my leg. I, I'm going to just stay home. No, you don't stay home. Everyone come. Get everybody out here. Deuteronomy 31, verse 12 and 13. Assemble the people, men, women, the little ones, even the traveler within your town, so that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and be careful to do the words of His law. And that their children who have not, know it, not known it may hear and learn the fear of the Lord your God as long as you live in the land you're going over the Jordan to possess. It's significant that God had instituted something. This is way before the church, mind you. The assembly of His people to go over something. This is who God is. This is what He's like. This is what He does. Let's go over it. And let's do it again. When are we doing it? Every year. They would have this feast where they would gather, and they'd specifically, as it went on, if you read the book of Ezra, you'll see where they stand after they have built. And he reads. And it was around this, the time of this feast. Where they would read the law of God to the nation. So that they knew who God was. And this word there is the assembly of the people. You'll be surprised to find out that the word church is not in any Bible. It's not a Bible word. It was inserted into the Bible. The word there is the word, is the Greek word, ekklesia. Now that word does not have anything to do with the word church. It comes from Germanic roots, the word church, which is kurke, which was buildings that were set, as set aside for worship. And which is where they translated that because the earliest Bibles we have were German. So they inserted the word Kurke, which then got transliterated into English as, there you go. So that's how you have the word church. So the word church is not in the Bible at all. The word ecclesia is, which is this word assembly. The assembly of God's people. Now, why was the assembly important? Because Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be 
bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Jesus is using a Jewish principle, which is baked into the law, of witness. If there was any legal argument, if there was anything that needed to be decided, it was a matter of one needing to go find another person to validate their claim, and then it was brought for discussion. And so where there was a second witness, which is now three people, that matter is settled because there are three people who agree, which is why it is so amazing to have God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They all agree about choosing you. So you are called beloved child of God by agreement. When the church of God assembles, whether it's two or three, he says, by definition, I command my presence and my authority to rest with this gathering. So what do you talk about when you are together, when you say, you know, I've been really having this pain in my leg? Go find someone who can, who can be with you in agreement for our Father. Let's go to our Father together. Let me ask with you. We have agreement. And what we ask for, we have not in a claim it sense, but because we have a Father and He has commanded His blessing in this gathering. It's precious what we have here. It is not something trivial. We're not having prayer time. We're saying, as a believer, I found another believer. Let's go to our Father. The assembly of God's people, this word ecclesia, is actually a Roman term. Which had to do with counsel. You will most clearly see it in Acts chapter 19. In Ephesus, there was problems. They were like talking about selling idols and they had problems with the, the kind of preaching. They were losing business. So they gathered the ecclesia, which was not the religious one, just the common town folk. Everybody gathered. Hannah and I had the privilege of actually going to Ephesus to the, to the place where they had this discussion. And it's a massive place. You could fit at least three to 400 people there. And there was a big argument, and they did not know why they were ecclesia. Why did you call us out of our homes to come and gather here? Because we have to decide a matter. So the deciding of matters is us saying, we need to come. When we come to the house of God, we are deciding on pursuing Him. We're deciding on what are the things that need to be ministered to in the house of God. What are the places where there is weakness which we need to strengthen. This is why I said last week, and I was not being dismissive, I wasn't being exclusive, but just by definition, this is not a place for everybody. As much as we love everybody, your home is a great place to have unbelievers. Having evangelistic meetings, having outreaches, great, wonderful places. If an unbeliever chooses to walk in here into this gathering, it is by their choice. We don't then change what we do to make sure that they are okay. Do you understand? We are here for a different purpose. We are here, we are assembled for a different matter. It's like me saying, I decided to go to uh, the local Lions Club and just walk in on their meeting and sit down. Be like, dude, what are you doing here? Well, I just came to check. I mean, sure, you can check it out. But you've got nothing to do with this meeting. We're here for a purpose. And unfortunately, the church of today is so bullied into a corner of trying to find a way that, uh, are you okay with today's meeting? Were you okay? With, uh, was, uh, no one's asking the question, was God okay with this meeting? Did we achieve the things that we came to assemble for? So the assembly of God's people has nothing to do with church. The assembly of God's people is Him saying, I will call you out and set you apart. So the word assembly has to do with calling out and setting apart. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18. I'm just going to run through these scriptures so you see it from scripture. 
Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18. For through him we have access to one spirit in the Father, to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together as a dwelling place for God by his spirit. Do you see that? That you and I, when we gather together, we are the temple of the living God. Wherever we are. Now next week, new man, we're going to be having a campfire. That we are the temple of the living God. We cannot let our language and our, and our conversation go into a place where we're just being men. We are an assembly of the Most High God. Do you understand? When women, when you gather, we cannot just let our conversation and our things just go off on, on tangents because we're just women. We're just having well, the mom, hashtag mom life. No, all those things might be true. However, I do it in view of this is the temple of the Most High God. We are gathered together by something that unites us that isn't our blood. It isn't even our stage of life. It is who we belong to. Now, on the other hand, if you're just having moms in general, great. Unbelievers in there sharing their life story, great. You never forget who you are. But now, this is an open place. This isn't an ecclesia meeting where the priority is saying, I need to make sure that we are worshiping God with all the conversations because someone might be throwing F-bombs all over the place. Right? And you're like, this is just who they are. However... I always respond as the temple of the living God. I respond in that context. It's the fear of God that teaches me to do that. 1 Peter chapter 2 also talks about the same thing. Behold, I'm laying in Zion a cornerstone, chosen and precious in the sight of God. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. But you are a chosen race. Verse 9 a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness. So when I look at the church of Jesus Christ, are we a people who declare the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness? Or is our gathered time about me feeling better about the life I live? When we gather, we should leave with at least... There is all kinds of things going on in your life and my life. I give you that immediately, straight out of the gate. But I will not allow my life circumstance to define who my God is. So when I gather, I look for not just someone I can offload all my junk on, but rather someone who can take me so that we can go to our Father. That might not happen in a public setting like this. So go find. So while the church gathers, use this time well. Because worship is happening long before music started, long after the music ended. Worship happens in these moments. So you right now, as you're responding to the word of God, there could be a response that within you is settled about something that's going on in your life. Lord, you have given me a peace about it. So I, re I receive you as the prince of peace. That word receive is a worship word. Because now there's an internal response in spirit and in truth to a revelation you are giving. And it's no song there. But when I have a song to say, Lord, you are my peace. Oh, man. Isn't that amazing when you have a song to articulate the things that you're feeling inside? But long before the feeling got there, truth had done its work. And if truth has not done its work, it's all just words. So I want to close with this. And it's an important thing. Just for your, Bible, just for your reference, look up um, Romans chapter 12. Goes through this in detail. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. It's all this idea of presenting ourselves to God as God being the one who builds us together. But I want to end with... The, it's, it's partly a warning, but partly an encouragement 
that we do this well. The reason we gather, and this is primary for all assembly, and this is why I even told you about why the word assembly is far more important, and this whole idea of ecclesia being called out. Because God would call them out of their homes. For what purpose? To rehearse the testimony of God. When you do not rehearse the testimony of God, guess what happens to you? You forget. You forget you ever belong to somebody. When you don't tell your spouse you love them, forget about Father's Day, Mother's Day, and whatever other day. She knows. I know she knows. When did you tell her? Uh, ten years later. My husband doesn't love me anymore. What do you mean he doesn't love you? Well, she's, he goes to work for you. and well, That's not the same. I don't care what you say. You forget a testimony of building one another up, of growing in this relationship. Because remember, that relationship needs fellowship to grow. If fellowship isn't there, you can have a positional relationship. I belong to Jesus, but guess what? It's, that's it. You, you just walked through the front door and stood there. You don't know anything about this house. You can say, I'm married to the Lord. I'm united with Him. You're still at the front door. It's a great front door to be at. But you're at the front door. Don't kid yourself. But when you grow in this fellowship with the Lord, it's an everyday thing. So in Judges, before Judges, let me go to Joshua chapter 24. Now therefore... This is in Joshua 24, verse 14. Now therefore, the fear of the Lord, now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose then this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers that they served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, this is a very famous verse that everyone loves. We even make it, put it on our doorposts, some of us, right? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is Joshua speaking to the people. He's about to die. He's an old dude. He has taken them through a conquest. He has finished almost all of the job. There are a few things left for the rest of the tribes to do. So he's gathered all the people. So this is at an assembly meeting. He's saying this to them. God pulled us out. God got us here. Are you willing to serve him with your whole heart? Sincerity of heart. Not just in like lip service. Now jump to Judges, which is the next book. So Joshua dies. Okay. Judges chapter 2, And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. You, yeah, we, some of us, are, that would be great to make it to 110. And they buried him in the boundaries of his inheritance in Timat Heres, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gash. And all of the generation of, of where... Joshua was leading them, that whole generation passed away. So it says there, so the generation that Joshua led, he took them into battle, all of these guys passed away. So imagine this in the church right here. There are people who right now are pouring into the life of this church. A day is coming when all of us will be gathered to our fathers. And there, are, and there arose another generation after them. What does it say there? Who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served foreign gods. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after the other gods from among the gods of the peoples who they were around, which is the Amorites, and they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. Now there is the start of the slide. 
for the nation of Israel. Now, God already told Moses this before he died. Joshua was there. They're going to rebel. They're going to have a hard heart. What was the problem? They did not know. So as much as we can fault the generation which was chasing after foreign gods, my question was, what was the generation that Joshua brought in doing? What were they doing? You don't get to retire in this place. If you're part of the family of God, there is no such thing as retirement. Because you have a walk with God that you have to pass on to the people of God. You have a relationship that is fueled by a fellowship that only you have. Personal thing, personal thing. But in the public sense, I need to make sure I'm passing it on. When I do so, my children and my children's children know God did this. Sure, my life seems slower right now. I feel tired more often. I feel, that's okay. That's okay. But what is God doing? Share that. I had the privilege this past week of sitting with um, Jane, who's, uh, Jane Noor, who's, the oldest member in our church right now. She turned 90 last week. And I'm sitting there with her, and her, you, sometimes your memory's a little foggy, and she, she stumbles over certain things. And I was just starting to just seed certain ideas. I was just like, so remember when God did this, and remember. And then she started to come alive, and then suddenly all of her, you could see all those things firing. And she started to like, and I remember when God brought me here. And I remember when I came to the church here. And I remember this. And, and she started to speak. Now, these are the things of God that this generation needs to hear. God has been with this church all the way through the 70s. All the way through the 80s. All the way through the 90s. All the way through the 2000s, 2000 teens. And now into this new decade. We are going to be, in another couple of years, we're going to be, a, we would have been a local church for 50 years. Not many local churches get to 50 years. Do we keep the testimony of God through the trials? Or is there a part of our history that we would say, oh, I'm God, we can forget that. Don't forget that. Because God took you through it. So when you respond to the work of God, when you respond to the things that God has taught, you start to become someone who says, Lord, I want to pass it to another generation. The things that we messed up, the things that we screwed up, the things where I wasn't a perfect father, I want to own up to it, talk to my children about it, so that they know that we have a journey to walk on. So can we do that together? Let's just give thanks. Father, we thank you for your love and care for the body of Christ. Lord, that we are here because of you. You have assembled us from different places. Lord, and the one thing that sets us apart is that we are called by your name. So Lord, we come to you in humility and we ask, Lord, for a grace within this local church. Lord, we remember the works that you have done. We remember your faithfulness to us. We remember that you are the God who led us through many, many trials. You're the God who led us on the mountaintop. So Lord, we give you praise for all of it. We respond to you with thanks. And we ask, Lord, that you'd help us build the church of Jesus Christ with you as the head. Teach us to minister to one another. Teach us to grow in worship, in spirit, and in truth. Amen. Amen.